Hey guys, welcome back to the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have with me an esteemed guest in the field of ufology, someone who's made uh, rounds in researching. Um, he's the author of many different books on the subject, and uh, I'm really honored to have him on. And who I have with me is Peter Robbins. He's an investigative writer, author, and lecturer whose writing and research are focused on the subject of truly anomalous UFOs and their implications for humanity. He's appeared as a guest and been a consultant on numerous radio television shows, uh, like Coast to Coast AM. Um, he's written for many different magazines, Phenomena Magazine, um, Open Minds Magazine, Fate. Um, uh, in 2000, 2007 to 2010, Robin served as a consultant in the city of Roswell, New Mexico, as their liaison to government research office on UFO-related matters. He, I mean, he's Art Bell, so I want to give him a big welcome to the show. Hey, Robert, Peter, thank you for joining me. How are um, I, I guess what well, we can start from the beginning, like I wanted to talk to you about your, your you and your sister's encounter, but how did you, I want to talk to you also about working with Bud Hopkins too. Um, how did it all start for you? Um, it all started when I was a kid with absolutely zero interest in this subject. And uh, I had with my sister, Helen, a profoundly unambiguous UFO sighting of five disc shaped craft. Um, that really challenged me to the core. I was uh, quite a naive kid uh, growing up in a simpler time. I guess I intuited from the adult world that this phenomena was not real, except in entertainment and fiction. And all of a sudden, there they were. And um, it was so overwhelming to me. And so... Um, disruptive of everything that I thought I knew, that I repressed the memory after a period of time, very successfully for many years. And more than 14 years passed until it came roaring back into my consciousness for reasons I think I understand. And I spoke with my sister about it, and she remembered it all very clearly in the detail that I did but then told me that there was more in her memory, which was, um, and she started to tell me about what I would now regard as a, a very archetypical series of conscious memories from an abduction experience. But at the time, this was completely beyond anything that I had ever heard about um, or been aware of. I guess it's fair to say that at the time, uh, the Betty and Barney Hill uh, event was, at the time I, my memory returned, was a great part of UFO literature. And I may have seen a copy of Look Magazine or Life Magazine that dealt with it as a kid. But if I did, it went, you know, kind of in one eye and out the other. And um, I became obsessed with the subject quite simply by virtue of what my sister had told me had happened to her. And uh, my career as a New York-based painter really derailed slowly after the fact. I continued to paint and teach painting at the School of Visual Arts, but something more important uh, and more obsessive had come into my life. And that's how it started. Yeah, and I was going to say, like, what, but when you to go off subject for a second, your painting career, did you ever get a chance to meet Andy Warhol? Because I'm sure I've told you I'm from Pittsburgh and we have a Andy Warhol museum before. Yes. Have you ever been to it? I haven't, but um, I knew Andy a little bit. We met when I was still an art student in 1968 and I ended up working <clears throat> as an apprentice in later years to two artists who were friends of his. And I interfaced with him a few times during that period. Um, he was a character with a capital C, but he absolutely changed our culture and uh, our perception of what we call art. And of course, he is from Pittsburgh like you. And the Andy Warhol Museum there is world famous and the largest repository, of course, of his work and papers and archive. Yeah, and Bud Bud was real into art as well too. He was a painter. And um, did you guys have the same kind of style when it came to art? Not at all. Um, he was, I guess you'd say, a generation ahead of me. He was a late period abstract expressionist, and I came of age as an artist in as an artist in New York, 
during a time that was dominated by conceptual and minimal art, um, which informed the work I was doing at the time that we met in the 1970s. He was a very dedicated, very fine professional painter, and he never stopped. He continued to paint and exhibit his work all through the many years that people in the UFO world know him best for, for his contributions in that area. Well, how did how did Bud's interest was, was Bud wasn't an experiencer himself, right? But something triggered his uh, his uh, his interest in the subject, right? Well, two things, Robert. Um, he spent his summers on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and um, as he relates related to friends back in the day and talks about in his wonderful memoir, Art Life and UFOs, one afternoon. I guess, as I recall, in the mid 60s, he was walking along a beach in the Cape and he watched a disc shaped object basically just moving along um, in the sky uh, over where he was on an overcast day. It was not life changing for him, but he remembered it. And years later, um, in about 10 years later, I guess, uh, a local um, merchant in his area who he knew and liked um, and went into his store one day and something was off and the store was empty except for Bud and him. And uh, he was comfortable enough to share with Bud a remarkable UFO account that had happened to him. Uh, and it was so intriguing to Bud that he started to investigate it. And it turns out he was a brilliant self-trained uh, investigator um, and wrote it all up. It was published. Um, I read it in a local New York newspaper and contacted him almost immediately. And that was what led to our very first meeting at his home on West 16th Street in Lower Manhattan. And, you know, it's funny how you look back at your life and you don't realize there's a moment where everything's changing. But of course, you know, you're in the moment, so you don't really realize it. And I think now about that first meeting we had, which was basically at the uh, his kitchen table uh, in his loft, talking about art and life and life in New York and UFOs, and not thinking for a moment that I would have, over the next 35 years, hundreds of cups of coffee at that table and quite a number of shots of scotch as well, uh, and that it was the beginning of a remarkable 35-year friendship, a good part of which I worked for him as his assistant. Also, we met uh, a full five years before he published his first UFO book. So um, our friendship was built on um, the fact that we were artists in New York with this growing interest in this profoundly uh, non-standard subject and then when you met bud and you guys started putting the pieces together that people were having experiences this had to have hit home it had to resonate with you right because you probably said okay it just wasn't me and my sister this is a worldwide phenomenon that's going on and, and was that kind of what caught your interest well um bud was the one who was actively uh developing um a scientific method of investigation and building case histories of people who alleged that they had had these kind of experiences. For the first years I was involved, obviously uh, I was profoundly interested, number one, and still am, in the abduction experience that people have. But again, I was more of a generalist while he was focusing in. Uh, and when he published his first book, which was a real game changer in the world of UFO studies, uh, called Missing Time, um, overnight within the world of UFO studies, he became extremely well known. Um, I continued along at a, a slower pace and was very um, glad to become more deeply involved because he needed more assistance. He was starting to get letters from around the world. And even at the quietest times, of answering letters or filing or uh, logging in audio tapes of interviews or hypnotic reg regressions, which he was very well trained in. Um, 
I knew in the back of my mind that what we were doing was very important historically, maybe not for the present. And I still feel that way. I mean, I think it's like, I think it's groundbreaking because you were some of the first two to be in, uh, investigating abductions from what we knew of it, right? I mean, it was like setting the precedent for what would kind of go how UFOs are investigated today, right? Well, you flatter me. Um, he was the one doing the real investigations. I was assisting him. And over the years, I assisted him on more than 200 of the more than 800 cases that he looked into, uh, some in a, in a fairly low key or limited way, other ones extremely deeply and going on over a course of many years. But yeah. there were other people coming up who were starting to follow uh, in the methodology and uh, the focus that he was really pioneering. So from from your take, like if you had to speculate, what would you say is going on with this abduction phenomena that we we have tangible tangible evidence of? I mean, I interview a lot of contactees and I believe them. It's just I love to hear evidence too, and and that's why I thought it was important to talk to you because you're you seem like you're evidence based as well, or or like the kind of like at least go with the facts that you can put together, right? Yes, um, I was very fortunate in having Bud as one of a number of mentors, but they also included a tough, no-nonsense New York City police detective who uh, was decorated quite a number of times for bravery, uh, died much too young, but was also a crack UFO investigator and a, uh, a former staff officer of the Hungarian army from World War II, who was a military scientist. And all three of these extraordinary people, and then later, uh, Stanton Friedman, I guess the last of my four real mentors in the work, all of them taught me directly or indirectly to build a case, to triangulate your evidence um, as though, you know, it was a police investigation or you're going to court. A lot of people approach the subject more ethereally. Um, for me, in a classic case, you're looking for physical evidences, um, historic evidences of the same kind of things happen in the same area or within the same family. And wild as it sounds, the overwhelming established facts are that the abductors, for lack of a better term, seem to be, with rare exceptions, following family bloodlines, um, photographic evidence, anecdotal evidence um, by itself. Um, witness-driven evidence is not taken as seriously uh, as other kinds of evidence. But Lord knows, uh, many people have been convicted of capital crimes with just witness evidence. But to build a case and then do your best to present it um, in its full force, like uh, you know, a trial, literally. Um, and Bud's best work was always following that model, always following that model. Yeah, and then did you kind of take the the facts that you learned and apply it to what you would kind of draw conclusions on what happened with you and your sister? Well, um, so much of this is still speculative um, and maybe we will never know the exact answers. Let's begin with the understanding that the UFO phenomena encompasses maybe more than we can imagine. Uh, I think for me, there is little doubt that a percentage of it is dealing with advanced technology under intelligent control from parts unknown coming and going for their own reasons. And part of their program is taking people, checking them, putting them into procedures, and then returning them. Um, but the UFO phenomena also covers the possibility of intelligences from other dimensions, um, phenomena that is only theoretical. Um, again, my focus has remained that group of other intelligences that is involved in taking people and um, to a degree putting things in their mind or blocking things in their mind um, when 
the field started really exploring the subject and taking it more seriously in the later 70s, the euphemism that was often used was they're experimenting. Um, I think it was an understandable choice of a word because we didn't know what the hell was going on. But I think at the same time, experimenting in, is not nearly as accurate as there is a program in place that they are deeply involved in. It is on the surface involves taking people, uh, tracking their movements, perhaps getting a better sense of physiologically how they change from abduction to abduction. Um, again, putting thoughts into people's heads or blocking uh, certain memories. And it's human nature to want to understand. And when we can't understand, it's also human nature in some cases to make your belief or your concerns what is. Uh, it's one thing to say, um, I am convinced that um, there are alien bases on the moon. It's another thing to say, there are alien bases on the moon. And so many people, especially now, more and more that the subject is becoming more and more mainstream, that there's more and more out there on it, available, uh, especially on the internet, much of it very um, up to the moment and fairly accurate, a huge amount of it absolute crap and completely unsubstantiated belief of one person or another that at the edges, um, there are literally religions, you know, it's belief based on faith that you and the people that you agree with are correct. And so it happened, as opposed to it may have happened, and you are interpreting it in a certain way, because that's what you're most comfortable with, or that's what you can wrap your head around. Uh, at this point in my work, after more than 40 years, I know more than most people know about the subject, but I know enough about it to know how little I actually know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, do you think it's 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 more it's important? I mean, like a lot sometimes people say to me, they say you cover a lot of the older cases, and I do. I love to, I love covering the older cases, like the Calvin Parker case, sure, the Travis Walton case. And the reason why I love covering these cases and talking about them is because there's some proof there and there's some evidence in some of the cases. And Great deal. Yeah. There's um, you know, so it's it's something that we can base our opinions on that we can then maybe not turn into facts but at least we can draw some kind of conclusions as to what's going on right well i'm with you robert i think um taking the ufo subject and setting it aside for a moment it's really important that we understand history it's important that we understand why things happened the way that they did in the past in different cultures and countries and societies to assist us in either not making the same errors again, or to take what worked in a historical perspective and apply it to the present. I think we live in a culture where more and more people could care less and less about history and the past. They don't see it as a living thing that they can learn from, but as some dry, dusty thing that put them to sleep in high school. Um, <laughs> and to make people more aware of what we'll call the classic cases, the ones that are the best documented, the ones that are backed up by actual physical evidence in support of multiple witness testimony. The Walton case, uh, the Betty and Barney Hill case, uh, Calvin Parker and um, Charlie Hickson uh, and the Pascagoula incident and so on down the pantheon of well-known cases. Um, I, I wish these things were taught in school and that younger people had a chance to normalize their attitudes about it um, before, well, things are changing, of course, and the ridicule factor has diminished considerably in the last years. But fear of ridicule infected this whole subject for the first 70 years or so. And ridicule is very powerful. People don't want to be made fun of. They don't want to look silly. They don't want to uh, uh, seem to be on the fringes of society because they associate, associate themselves 
with the subject that people are so deeply conditioned to think of as wild, crazy, you know, um, dysfunctional. Yeah, but now it seems like we might be at a point in our time where that's finally dissolving because of the, the, the Navy coming out with uh, videos. It seems like we're in a slow week of disclosure. Would you say so? I would say so. Uh, I think we are definitely in time where there is increasing movement in this area. I would expect and imagine there is resistance uh, at the highest levels and on the part of secret keepers to not to try to manage the flow of information. It's one thing to say, oh my gosh, UFOs are real. And some of them are truly advanced machines from parts unknown that aren't made by human beings on earth. And gosh, isn't that exciting? That's one thing that the public seems to be able to assimilate at this moment. And that well-known personages in the world of uh, politics media, the sciences can begin to attach their names to and say, I take this seriously. But there's no way that the media, major media, is ready to support the idea of abductions, of um, hybrid individuals, part us, part them, uh, a long and colorful cover-up of the subject, beginning with elements within the United States government, and they're managing it. I stage managing it a bit like a piece of theater. And there will be more reports, official reports coming. And the at the highest level, I think those behind them uh, may have a lot more awareness of what's going on than they're alleging. I think in, in the minds of some of these power brokers, they see this whole thing has to be done slowly because otherwise we'll all freak out. Um, and there may be some truth to that. This is uh, quite a jump for most people, remembering that you and I and folks that already are studied in this subject and take it seriously do not represent the majority of our population, not even close. Not yet. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, Helen's experience, like because uh, I don't know if people saw the the video you did with Richard Dole and I did. I knew I knew that how your sister Helen was a big rock star. She wrote songs for the rock stars, and uh, I know she worked with bands like Blue Oyster Cult, and yeah. she was influential in the punk scene. And I I yeah. just wanted to give that a big shout out. I think that's so cool. But like, how did she handle this as well as like? Did she have continued experiences as well? And what did she think of all of it? Um, she, when we first talked about it after more than 14 years of not, uh, she made it clear to me that she had never forgotten that the memories that she was sharing with me were conscious memories that she was recalling from the time she was 12 years old, that she seemed to have had several other experiences she was beginning to explore with Bud, um, her attitude from the get-go was this is real, this happened, this happens to people, and I'm damned if I'm going to make believe it doesn't or shut up about it. She was very uh, outspoken um, about the subject. She felt that she, um, being a public person already, um, had a responsibility on a certain level to not back down from it, to um, speak about it in interviews, even with the music business press, um, we did a number of television shows together with Bud, without Bud, including the old Geraldo show. And um, she was not really a fan of them. Um, she felt that this was done without her permission, um, that when certain things were telepathically being communicated to her, for example, uh, we love you, you're special, we will not harm you, we will not hurt you. She was experiencing pain from what they were doing at the time. So it started with a certain amount of hypocrisy for her. And um, I, I think she channeled that being pissed off about it uh, very well into her art, her music, her poetry, her writing, and her general presence. 
Yeah, I would say I would say she's a legend, you know, uh, such a legendary character in the music scene. It's amazing. So let me ask you this from thinking about your sister's experiences and the, the cases that you've studied over um, over the long run. Could you even make a determine on whether these are negative or, you know, how some people say they're a spiritual transformation? Would you would you do you lean on either fence? That's a great question, Robert. And there are several ways to approach it. And I'm not sure what exactly the truth is here. Number one, we may be dealing with a number of different entities, beings, intelligences that are involved in taking and returning people with very um, different motivations. Some we might interpret it as positive, others negative. Um, more and more, as you know, there are two factions regarding their perception of this whole thing. One is welcome the Space Brothers to a certain degree. They are here to help us. We need to uh, grow up enough to stop clubbing each other to death over where the line is drawn in the dirt and get out of our Neanderthal reality before they will fully reveal themselves to us and perhaps be of assistance as many people maintain. And that my experiences with these intelligences were very positive and transcendent. Other people have the hell scared out of them, um, do not feel it's a positive experience, feel that they are, their, whatever their program is, is about control uh, of us um, not that we seem to have worked out a way to uh, defend ourselves against, you know, this hypothetical possibility. Also, the same thing may be happening procedurally to countless people over the decades, but some people are basically, because of character, personality, past experiences, um, open to the unknown and more welcoming of um, adventures uh, that they may, adventure is probably not the right word, but experiences that are alien to them and generally have a positive attitude and look for the best in experiences and people in et cetera. Other people um, are more cautious, are more guarded. And I think another thing that we have to consider is when I was deeply involved in this work with Bud, starting in the late seventies, through about 2000 or so, um, the world was not nearly as filled with accounts or popular fiction or movies or books or television shows dealing with this. And I think that isolation that people felt having these experiences earlier on did not necessarily lend itself to a very positive attitude. I understand, um, and I believe, that yeah. a good number more people now that report their experiences um, to credible and uh, you know respectable groups of researchers uh, are reporting more positive experiences. Does this mean that more positive things are happening? Uh, that the intelligences involved are... Um, kind of amping up the program um, in a positive way? Does it mean to play devil's advocate for a moment that, you know, they are dark and nefarious, but they've gotten better at, you know, their PR and shaping the experience in a way that's positive? People will, in the work, again, will say, it's this, or it's this, and that's the way it is, and everybody else is wrong. I know that I don't know, and that we are still trying to sort this out. Um, and that again, it's human nature, you know, to go with the great mantra on the X-Files poster, I want to believe. Everybody wants to believe something about this or not believe something about this. Um, so, you know, we're back to square one again, and just trying to put the pieces together. Uh, I'll, complete the thought with the great parable about the six blind men and the elephant. And, you know, one guy has got a hold of the leg, the other one, the ear, the other, the truck, the trunk, the trunk, 
the other the tusk, the other the tail, and they're arguing with each other. Another one's got his hand on the side of the elephant about what the elephant is. And they're all right, and they're all wrong in the eyes of the other ones for obvious reasons. That's pretty amazing. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about two more people before we finish up. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, because you've talked, you've spoken about William Wilhelm Reich and his thoughts on UFOs and also James Forrestal. And I know those can probably both be uh, lengthy. So however you want to explain it, but I, I thought those would be two interesting people to touch on. Well, um, you've chosen two great men uh, who have had a great influence on my life. I started to read Wilhelm Reich's work when I was still a teenager and um, ended up in my late 20s and into my 30s um, as um, in therapy with his former first assistant uh, for many years, Dr. Ellsworth F. Baker. Um, I was very privileged to meet many people that knew and worked with Dr. Reich over the years, wrote about his UFO related work extensively. And I don't think there's another person or philosophy or man of science or social observer who has had more impact on my life than Dr. Reich, who is very uh, maligned as a rule and almost always by people who have never read a word by him, but things about him. Um, James Forrestal, a very different story. I became aware of Forrestal in about 1987 or so. And my first thought was, why have I not heard of this man before? Um, I had heard his name in that there's an aircraft carrier named after him. Uh, James Forrestal was our first secretary of defense uh, at the request of President Truman at the end of World War II. He literally dismantled the old war department that had been in place since uh, the revolution and created our modern Department of Defense created it. Um, his life reads like a Horatio Alger story of work hard, achieve, modest backgrounds, rise to become the second most powerful man in the world as our first Secretary of Defense. Um, on the surface, uh, an alpha male, um, seemed like a tough guy, but quite a scholar and a sensitive person who psychologically, I think, was crushed under the weight of the helplessness that he felt heading the most powerful defense establishment in the history of, you know, the last 10,000 years, let's say, and not being able to make any inroads into understanding what was going on here or how to defend ourselves against it. Somebody else might just say, hey, nobody could. And, you know, I did the best I could. It crushed him emotionally to a degree where he had a profound nervous breakdown as he stepped down from office. And for the men around Truman, um, this was, of course, the, the biggest security situation in the history of humanity. And in 1949, when he had his profound breakdown, nobody knew anybody that went to therapy or saw a psychiatrist, or counseled, you know, with, with some kind of uh, advisor psychologically. It just wasn't part of our culture, with the rarest exceptions, of course. Uh, now, of course, if it hasn't touched your life directly, a lot of people you know, or their kids have been involved in therapy or, you know, seeing a psychologist or what have you. And he became... I am convinced in the minds of these most powerful men, the number one security risk in the history of the Western world. And in their minds, I think um, if he recovered and he was institutionalized for some time at the Bethesda Maryland Naval Hospital, most appropriate as a former secretary of Navy, um, that if he recovered, whatever that meant, and then had a relapse, he could say anything. And he had to die. He had to die. Uh, Forrestal understood this, I am convinced. And immediately following his breakdown, tried to take his life at least two times that I've documented within a matter of days, was stopped. Ultimately started to be treated clinically for his depression by the best people available. 
and started to recover. And I make a case in my papers and articles and the documentary that I've done on Forrestal that that once again necessitated them having to do the job for him. And hours before he was due to be released from Bethesda, uh, he went out a window and that was that. But uh, he was a great American and people should know who he was. Uh, it's also a very genuine casualty of uh, the darkest side of the early days of the UFO cover-up. Yeah, I would say, is, uh, do you, so you felt like he felt like that, that he couldn't protect the humans from being abducted. Do you think it came down to that, if you had to speculate? I don't think the abduction phenomena was really part of his thinking. I think just this unknown potential threat, these things that our fastest aircraft could not get close to, uh, that in a myriad of declassified, fully authentic, uh, very impressive documents that are available, you know, um, to the public um, in mass at this point, there is no question that while we are officially putting it down and making fun of the subject, um, we, the military and the intelligence community, were taking it very seriously indeed. And again, he had a character um, aspect to him where he deeply personalized all of his professional and personal successes and failures. And uh, where, again, somebody else might go home after a bad day at the office, you know, kiss the husband or wife, pet the dog, have dinner, watch some TV, resolve to do better the next day. It really ate him up. And I think it was a mark of his character, but um, he was not able to deal with it and he had to go. That's really sad. Um because it, it, it seemed like he was a great man. I mean, from what I've been able to read about him. And um, my last question for you is something really important. But the, 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 you hear it go around the Wilson leak, the Admiral Wilson leak. Um, I know Richard Dolan was uh, part of that. Um, or there was a, and, and I talked to Michael Hall about it as well. Um, what do you know about the Wilson leak and how important would you say that is for someone who's researching like the history of UFOs? Um I'd say it. what I know is that this high-ranking admiral uh, made certain statements regarding the subject, giving us um, uh, pause to accept that he took it as very seriously and very real. But then we have the ongoing dueling of the authorities, the experts, the historians, which is still going on. And... Um, I occasionally, when somebody would say, what do you think of such and such? Or what's your opinion on? Um, I will surprise them by saying, I don't have an opinion on that. And usually they will react. And, what do you mean? You're an authority on this subject. You write books and you, you know, study it all the time. How can you not have an opinion on it? Well, um, right now, uh, just a few days ago, I was looking at a new series of counter allegations in the Wilson case and realizing I still don't feel I have enough of a sweep of the actual information to have an info a fully informed opinion. And I'm funny like that. I would rather simply say, I don't have an opinion on that yet because I don't feel I have enough information to have an informed opinion. And if I can't have an informed opinion, I'll wait and I'll get back to you when I do. So. I'm going to have to leave that question at that. It's very controversial. Um, there is a lot of impressive data on both sides of the argument. And of course, Wilson ain't saying nothing uh, at this point, as one can imagine. Um, we've seen things like this occasionally with a, especially with a sharp researcher or journalist or investigative writer who will manage to put somebody in a situation where they either think they're speaking off the record or they say something that's too literal. Um, I remember about 30 years ago, it was Admiral Bobby Inman, who was the head of um, the Navy's, as I recall, nuclear submarine program, who made a what seemed to be a very definitive situation on how seriously he took UFO reality. 
got called on it publicly by a particular researcher and then basically um, disappeared off the map in terms of commenting on it in future, understandably. Um, and we'll continue to see this kind of thing as things loosen up, I think. I, I agree too. I think I think we're in like really exciting times. Like this might be the best time to be a, a UFO uh, uh, fan because of just the just of what's coming out. I mean, it's yeah. it's so exciting. Would you agree? I would. I think if one was going to become involved in the work, either just as a increasingly informed observer, or as somebody that wants to be part of it, and um, you know, this is an unregulated field. You don't need a license to practice UFO studies. Um, most of us begin with whatever specialty areas we have to inform our investigations and investigate and put our evidence together and sooner or later have an opportunity to publish an article or give a talk at a local library or a conference or in this day and age, of course, especially um, through the COVID period, um, to speak online. Um, I regularly connect with different groups around the country um, for obvious reasons. Uh, it's also a lot more economical to not have to bring you to another place. Um, but it is a very exciting time to be involved in the field one way or the other. I agree. Well, I, I want to thank you for taking your time to do this. And if you could tell people where they could find your books, your documentaries, your website, all any all that stuff. Yeah. Um, first, my email address is my first initial and last name and home state, P-R-O-B-B-I-N-S-N-Y at yahoo.com. Uh, my website is hopelessly out of date at this moment and being renovated. Um, you can find me on Facebook, and I post all of my um, upcoming um, events or whatever I'm doing regarding this stuff there. There are a number of Peter Robbinses. I'm the one listed in Ithaca, New York. Um, also, I do a weekly live radio broadcast on KGRA Digital Broadcasting. The show is called Meanwhile, Here on Earth. It often covers the UFO subject, usually, but not always. And it's usually either a two-hour in-depth interview with leading figures in the work or related fields or panel discussions of appropriate, interesting people discussing aspects of this. And that's seven to nine uh, live on Monday nights. Wow, that's that's awesome. Well, um, thank you again, and it was really nice to meet you. And uh, yeah, we should do this again as things transpire. I'd love to have you on again. Be glad to, Robert. All right. All right. Well, thank you. That thank you, and have a good day. You too.